G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Look, I started having a listen to the epic two hour long Looch and Flatsoid special and I figured I could pick the eyes out of the various comical fails along the way. So here we go. There's no yeah. such thing as Coriolis Force for, for, for pilots, mate. No. Why wouldn't that be there? There isn't. Like I said, they're literally the physics of flight is based upon a stationary Earth, which means no Coriolis, and a flat plane to keep a, 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 a basic level altitude. I don't really agree because the plane, the, Coriol, the Coriolis force does affect the plane, albeit a little bit. I can't. Slightly. No. I can't. Even if you had the Earth spinning underneath, it won't have any effect on the plane. Only the plane's destination, but the flight would do nothing to the to the dynamics of the plane. Remember, air then, is unbonded. The, the air the airplane's you... flying through the air, not attached to the ground. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't have any uh, significance on the airplane at all. The only difference it would have is where it lands up. up. What the? The only difference will be where the plane ends up. Well, that's comical. That's the whole point of Coriolis in the first place, Flatsoid. An uncorrected flight path is not going to get you where you want to go, but here's the thing. Coriolis is small, really small, like a three kilometer an hour crosswind. So it gets lost in the other directions along the way. But here you go. Let's just have a look at Wolfie's plane actually making these adjustments via the autopilot. Okay, now for the money shot, as they say in the banking industry. I said banking industry. This is actual footage, by the way. Sorry about that, Danny. I feel your guts are squirming right about now, so you better sit down. You might faint when you understand what is about to be shown to you and the whole world. So here is the flight test data screen from Wolfjet 1. First, the two values in the yellow circle are the positions of the two control surfaces. One does up and down, and one does left and right stuff. The two values in the red circle are what the plane is currently doing, the pitch and the roll, and that is measured by various sensors. Not saying I know how exactly how everything works. Up in the top left you'll see the current altitude that is measured. Now if we watch we see the two control surfaces adjusting under the control of the autopilot. Now Wolfie has had the fish about an hour ago so he's off napping, I hope he's napping right about now. The ailerons adjust the roll and that will turn the plane slightly left or right. The elevators on the tail plane, they control the pitch or the nose up and down. So roll VT and let's have a look. Oh look, the elevator decreased the angle slightly and the nose of the plane dipped slightly. Watch the altitude on the far left go from 44,940 and it starts creeping up to 44,950 and the elevators decrease from 1.2 to 1.1. Altitude goes back to 49,440 and the elevators return to 1.2 again. I wonder why they did that. You know, wind shear and earth curve are the two correct answers here, Danny. Similarly, if you watch the ailerons, the ailerons, you'll see them rolling the plane ever so lightly. And a roll makes the plane fly ever so slightly, not straight. So I wonder why it's doing that regularly too, Danny. Any ideas? Well, Crosswind and Coriolis are the two answers here, BT Dubs. So there you have it, Danny. Challenge met in every way. If you really think you've met the burden of proof for my million dollar challenge, walk your little ass down to the courthouse and sign your real name to the papers and sue me for it. I can't dare you enough. Oh, and um, tap Danny, because he still owes me that one million dollars, and I haven't gotten it yet. I could potentially believe it if it was like some people lying on a common motivation, but millions of people, it gets a little bit harder to believe. Okay, let's take, for, let's take an analogy then. Um, when you watch a space mission and they're all sitting there and they've got all these computer screens in front of them, you got, for instance, a data analyst just sitting there and he's just looking at a graph. That's all he's looking at. And that graph is telling him what he's happening. He's saying, okay, these are the temperatures of the boosters. This is uh, how much fuel you still got. 
This is the speed you're going. This is the, you understand that he's just getting data. Okay. Mm -hmm. To him, that's real data. Could yeah. it just be similar a simulation data? Like you have a program running that's just well, giving can, fake data. He can see the thing, so it wouldn't Not, be. You never space. ever see the rockets in space. Never. That, no. Never see any rockets in space, hey? Oh boy. Flatsoid has Flatsoid 11, the Falcon Heavy launch from January 2023 again, I see. That is the one that Astronomy Live videoed the rocket and the boosters from launch to landing with no cuts. And I use that as a reference timeline to do a supercut with many other videos of that launch. And if you haven't seen that supercut, do have a look. The link is in the description as always, and it's rather spectacular. Now, what is particularly great about this supercut is that all the videos are synchronized in time, so that you are seeing the rockets at exactly the same point in time in every video. Like from Myrtle Beach, the rocket only appears above the horizon 94 seconds after launch. And yet, Astronomy Alive is videoing that rocket and it's 23 kilometers up. That's Earth Curve for you guys. Oh, when I go on holiday, have Okay, I'm gonna have to pause. Yeah, where's Wally is? He sticks his nose everywhere. Then you say, including satellite imagery. Nope, there's no such thing as satellite imagery from space. High that, altitude that's, imagery, that's what yes. High, high, high image, high altitude imagery, yes, perfectly fine, because it keeps still to the natural law. And there is Flatsoid lying about the ISS again. Now we know that it's there and it's 420 kilometers up and we can measure it. And Wolfie and I did measure it one night way back in June 2023. And a link to that video is in the description. And good friend Astronomy Live records and tracks the ISS passing overhead. So we know that it is a man-made object up there. So naturally there will be images from cameras mounted on that man-made object. And guess what shape of the Earth is when we look back from those cameras? Tis globe. Oh. When I go on holiday, every... okay, I'm gonna have to pause. Yeah, where's Wally? Is he sticks his nose everywhere? I think you've also seen that, Michael. Where's Wally? Yeah. He's just everywhere. He's trying his uttermost best to stick his nose in everything and just, I don't know, claim victory with everything. But the guy's I... such an idiot. Yeah, I ain't got to... his, his name's really apt, isn't it? It's apt for him. <laughs> it's appropriate for him. Okay. And we want to circumnavigate this pool. Mm. So now we're going to travel this way around. Yeah, that's not there, what we're that just doing. circumnavigate. We just circumnavigated. That that's not what they're doing. They're that's going exactly what's happening. Right. I'm just right. I'm making a point. You can circumnavigate on a flat Earth too. Okay, now let's take, for instance, your globe. This is why your globe has an issue. Okay. Circumnavigation. Oh, this will be great. One more orbit for $500, please. The only way you're going to validate for a globe Earth is if they do north to south circumnavigation, but that's never, ever been done. You get people that claim Why? Why north to south? Why not east to west? Because we can do that on a flat Earth too. We can do yeah, it on a course. pineapple yeah. earth. So? So, if you want to claim it's a globe, travel north to south then. Okay. This has been done many times, so just stop lying, Flatsoid. Let's put it this way. If you want to choose to prove it's a globe, Lou, mm -hmm. would you agree that it would be impossible on a flat Earth to do circumnavigation south to north, north to south? Okay, Luch, you see here I've got the Gleason's map on. Uh huh. So you would agree that if they had to travel circumnavigate north to south, it would be impossible because they won't come out by the other side. Uh, right. Yes. Okay. So why is it every time someone does circumnavigation, they travel like this, like that, like that, because and then they finally meet up flat. again? Oh, what a great A porky pie there, Flatsoid. One more orbit flies like this, just as you requested. And now what have you got? More denial and nah, -uh, I guess. You know what was odd? Thank you very much for your super chat, Roger. Really appreciate it. That's a good one. I think it was Global One or something. Not Global One. One more orbit. Oh, he can't even get the name of the plane right. So we are really in for some cracker misrememberings about this one now, aren't we? we I think it was like a few years ago where they had the pilots doing a, a polar 
circumnavigation, as I said. But if you look at their flight logs and you look at everything, they didn't fly circumnavigate north to south. No. They went to Antarctica and turned around. Turned around? You mean they flew south for nine hours until they were right over the South Pole, then they were suddenly flying north again. They turned just 52 degrees to jump from one polar great circle to another polar great circle. And here is the airport codes and the times for every leg along the flight. Oh, and I was lucky enough to be able to get some still images of the night sky from the ground as the plane flew over in the dark. Its nav lights were easily seen and we know this image was taken at the pole. So that's all, right. you should be able to confirm this. How do you find the South Pole from the Southern Cross? And look where that puts the South Celestial Pole, by the way, man. That image in its own right is proof of the globe. The SCP at the Zenith, you're gonna need a globe for that. Something just doesn't look right here. Sir Ranulf Fiend and Sir Charles Ranulf Burton. Fiend. <laughs> Charles Sorry. Burton, you think navigated north to south? Didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's look at their circumnavigation. Pole to pole. <laughs> okay, let's go. What needs to be done, they have to travel from the North Pole to the South Pole in dead reckon zero degrees. All and the way around. come back to the North so Pole. Yeah, and that's not all the way around. Okay, look, look what's happening, guys. Yeah. This is all the time, no matter what, which is exactly what I'm saying. And now just watch as Flatsoid totally fails at maps and directions. Look at that what? train. They get to Antarctica there. And which way is he going? East. Did Flatsoid just say east? East. Not. Why is he not carrying on south and end up coming back north. Why indeed, Flatsoid. You have been struggling with 3D maps for a long time, haven't you, mate? Okay. <laughs> so why can't it fly high and do a circumnavigation north to south exactly zero degrees? Fly over Antarctica at cruising altitude, hey? Right over 90 south, the South Pole proper? Well, that's exactly what one more orbit did. And as I said before, I have images to prove that they did it as well. Something just doesn't look right here. There's no point. Why <laughs> even your beloved ISS doesn't cross through Antarctica? The ISS is an orbital inclination of 51.6 degrees, so the maximum north or south is the 51.6 degrees latitude. Now, 51.6 is not just some random number, there is a very good reason for it. When you launch into orbit, you have by default the orbital inclination equal to the latitude of the surface where you launched. 51.6 was chosen by Russia and America to suit the Russian launches. America launches to the ISS at 33 degrees, and so they have to spend a fair bit of fuel adjusting the inclination of the orbit to match that of the ISS. There are polar orbits of satellites that do pass over Antarctica. Heaps of them, in fact. In fact, all of them. Anything that is a polar orbit must, by its very definition, pass over both poles. Kind of logical, really. And here is a nice nighttime time lapse showing a whole pile of polar orbit satellites zipping by in the night sky. Thanks, Robert Schwartz. Something just doesn't look right here. And ever wonder why SpaceX launches from Vandenberg? It's to go over the South Pole south over the water. They can't launch to the ISS from Vandenberg without flying over populated USA, which they kind of want to avoid. Okay, but let's do it this way, PJ. Let's ask Lou, what is the sun? Yeah, what it's is a, the sun? It's, it's a to... nuclear... Uh, it's a... It's a... Lou it's... claims nuclear fusion. So yes, plasma. nuclear right. fusion. Can you, That's fine. Can okay, great. That? How do you know... How do you know the sun is plasma based on nuclear fusion in a vacuum. We use spectroscopy, I think. Which requires to... containment, yes. Requires containment? What the? How the? Why the? Now, spectroscopy is just taking any light, tossed, tossing it through a prism and looking at the various amounts of, of each frequency of light. 
But more particularly, we're looking for atomic absorption bands or atomic emission bands that are specific to each element. And that way we know that the light source contains those elements. So you see some basic spectroscopy at work. Spectroscopy isolates light through prisms and containers. I work with a spectrometer. I literally can show you it at work. It literally has to be contained to concentrate the light into a prism. Much time noting this for color matching with the spectrophotometer. I now place the spectrophotometer on the clean panel and select my work order. Once it's selected there, I push that plus button in the top left and those three dots let me know that the spectrophotometer is flat against the panel. I push a button on the side, boom, takes a reading. Then it asks me to rotate the uh, tool 90 degrees and take a second reading. So it wants to do two readings from different angles to make sure it gets a good match. That's cool. But this is not the same as emission spectroscopy from the stars now, is it? Astronomers are working with tiny amounts of light split through prisms and measured by an array of sensors. Also note when you're looking at the sun using spectroscopy, you're looking through Earth's atmos. Atmosphere flat soy? you keep forgetting the full and correct name. Oh, and because they are measuring the light scientifically through the atmosphere, they are able to apply corrections for the atmosphere as they know what the atmosphere does to the light and they can account for the effects of the atmosphere. Yes, it's getting a spectra of the sun and you can tell a whole lot about what is happening on the sun from that spectra. You really do not have a handle on the science of astrophysics, do you, Flatsoid? Something just doesn't look right here. Great, so the globe doesn't have evidence for the sun being what it claims to be. Other than all the evidence we already have, wow, nut uh is strong in this one, folks. Yeah, let's just say I stuck a glass of water in a vacuum chamber at sea level and it starts boiling because it's starting to degas, the oxygen's starting to go out. Okay? Uh huh. Now I take that same glass of water and I just go up to Mount Everest and it starts doing the same. Um, that's all. Degassing due to low pressure and boiling due to low pressure are two very different things. Degassing is where the dissolved gases in the fluid, like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, are turning into bubbles and leaving the solution. That's not boiling. Boiling is where bubbles of water vapour are forming and leaving the liquid. You get the most basic stuff wrong, don't you, mate? Hmm, could I be wrong? And the water would probably freeze. No. Now the question is, based on I've taken the distance away from your mass, why is it giving exactly the same, uh, the same demonstration, but I'm further away from your mass? It, that, there's more mass under it, so. Yeah, but the closer you are, the distance, remember your mass attraction of mass, which isn't actually a thing anymore, um, literally is about the distance from the mass, center of mass. Yeah. So if I'm so further away, it yeah. would be a weaker, correct? Yes. You wouldn't feel then why like is it I'm able to get the same results no matter the distance if I just change the pressure? Are you seriously expecting the height of Mount Everest to be significant? 10,000 meters is just peanuts. Now, gravity at the top of Mount Everest is around 9.77 meters per second per second, and at sea level, it's 9.8 meters per second per second. Mate, the mass of the Earth is so huge and so mind-numbingly enormous that the mere 10 kilometers is nothing. And remember, you're not going from zero meters to 10,000 meters. From the mass, center of mass. R is the distance between the center of the two masses. So you're going from 6,371 kilometers to 6,381 kilometers. That's so it stopped trying to do maths. You're terrible at it. Well, guys, I'm just going to wrap it up right about there. There's so much happening in these videos that I just can't cover it all. And I will leave you with yet another of my face palms. Oh, I'm not good at this stuff. I'm going to throw my hand in a little bit of slitting saw.
Yes, it wouldn't be a good day if it wasn't for a Wally fail. After slitting the first one perfectly, I went to do the second one and what I had done was I'd cut halfway on this one and then I changed the program to cut the other half. I told it to start from halfway in the G-code, which it did nicely, but I didn't realise that when you start again this time, it's going to start over this side. So I had, this, I had the, the slitting saw over this side and it wanted to go right through the piece and drove a bit straight into it. And that was easy enough to fix, but this might not. Now bent me sore. Oh dear.